support. And today's workshop is called Preventing Virtual Classroom Fatigue. Uh, so just a couple of uh, points about today's workshop, as everyone has probably experienced just from doing Zoom meetings. Um, time online, synchronous, virtual, all day long can be really exhausting to students. And so this workshop is meant to help you get some tips and ideas for how to utilize face-to-face -face time with your students to increase their engagement and hopefully reduce some of this classroom fatigue that they're experiencing. Uh, so the iDesign team, I'll introduce in just a second, is going to talk about different uh, instructional strategies that you can use during class time to break up Zoom meetings, uh, Zoom events, and to keep students uh, working on and with each other and engaged with you. Um, and then finally, they'll offer suggestions for using other tools and how to do that um, in tandem with your virtual class sessions. So I'm very excited to welcome our, our partners. Um, Carmen Christopher is one of the lead learning architects at iDesign, and she's been a full-time teaching faculty member in higher education, um, as well as an endowed chair for academic support services for over two decades. Uh, she has graduate degrees in rhetoric, textual studies, and communication. Her instructional design specialties include universal design and assessment. And then also joining us today is Rebecca Kelly, a leading learning architect also at iDesign, and she's worked in higher education for 15 years. She holds an MBA in marketing, a master's in organizational leadership, and a doctorate in business administration and marketing as well as a graduate certificate in instructional design. She served as an assistant professor, curriculum specialist, and program lead, and her approach to instructional design focuses on building strong faculty relationships and enhancing the student experience. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us today, and thank you to our presenters. Um, if you could, just be sure if you're um, not talking and you're just listening, make sure your microphones are muted. If you have questions, please post those in the chat, um, but I'm sure they'll be breaking periodically uh, to take those questions. And there you go. Thanks all. Thank you, Christina. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. So uh, we like to, um, PowerPoint's not always the thing you wanna use, but we like to throw up a slide so that you can um, see what we're gonna be talking about. You're in the right spot. Uh, but I do want to call attention to this web, uh, sorry, email address here. That is uh, the address that will get directly to our help uh, support desk. And um, you can contact an instructional designer directly, a learning architect directly, and we will meet with you individually to work on your specific needs. And that's really been helpful because um, we all know, even if we teach the same subject, we're just a little bit different in how we approach the subject and the topics we like to cover, et cetera. And so um, at any time, if you would like to have individual support, we are here for you. So um, I'll blast that email every once in a while, but just so you know that we are here available to help you. Okay, so having said that, we're gonna talk about virtual classroom fatigue and we're doing it, um, you hear Zoom used a lot because we use Zoom a lot. But uh, it's all video uh, conferencing, sort of web conferencing tools. So if you're on WebEx, if you're on um, Collaborate, I think is the one in Blackboard. Yes, Rebecca, is that right? Yeah. That's Collaborate. Um, so if you're on one of those, these all of these things apply. But I think because Zoom sort of took over the universe there, right, when COVID hit, that um, we tend to use Zoom a lot. But we are, we are talking about all kinds of video conferencing tools. All right, so our first um, sort of thing we wanna talk about is what is this Zoom fatigue thing that people keep talking about? It is actually, there's research out there and the, uh, the citation's on the very last slide, so you can, you'll can you be able to access this article. But it's sort of this tiredness, sometimes anxiety um, from overusing these video conferencing platforms. And, um, you know, Widerhold and, you know, lists a lot of things that happen uh, when you aren't able to interact with people in person. And one of those things is that um, 
video conferencing tools are nearly real time, but not actually real time. And so that little delay, your brain is trying to fix it. And so that's one way that you get really tired. It, it's trying to, to, you know, make those things be real time and it's not quite real time. Um, then you add on to that the, the different blips and oh, my internet is kind of spotty right now and all of that. And then you end up with a lot of fatigue. Um, so that's what the Zoom fatigue means. Um, but the first thing you want to do when you're looking at your classes to prevent the Zoom fatigue is to first ask yourself, is synchronous video the best way to present what I'm doing? And it, it may be, but um, what is the purpose of the synchronous video session? That is the main question that you want to ask yourself because we're going to present some maybe different ways to think about it. Um, yeah, so that's the first question. Okay, so um, now I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca. Re Rebecca, I'm going to hit the next slide. Here you go. <laughs> okay, so a couple things to consider is, you know, this type of learning is new for a lot of you and for your students. So trying to figure out if video is going to be the best option for your course, you want to make sure that you have a chance for everyone to step away. Like Carmen said, it can be really difficult to be on all the time in a Zoom meeting. You have to be paying attention because sometimes people are cutting in and out. You have to be paying attention because you're looking at a screen. You have eye fatigue from watching the screen. Uh, you know, trying to listen. Sometimes people talk over each other. It's hard to read social cues. There's so many things we're working on so hard. So building in a time for no camera gives you a chance and gives your students a chance to take a little break, to reduce some of that extra effort that's going in. So you want to build in some opportunities for no camera time during your class period. It allows your students to kind of sit back and relax, maybe just listen, work on something completely different uh, for a period of time and change how they're learning but to give their bodies, their minds a break from all of that activity that's required to stay in, you know, in touch and engaged in, in a Zoom meeting. Uh, another option is to have your office hours you know, without a camera. We call them walking meetings uh, at iDesign often. That's when you don't have your camera on and you can be doing other things. You can be taking a walk, walking your dog. I have someone I meet with regularly who takes a walk with their child and pushes him in a stroller on our, call, on our calls and we just talk it out. He puts in his headphones and you know we just go. That's another option. It may make your students feel more comfortable because you're not face to face. They may be even more open but it also doesn't require them to have to be in a space, sitting properly and engaging. Again, utilizing all of that effort that then translates into fatigue later on. So when you're on camera, which is a requirement in this current situation we're in with COVID, um, you do need to definitely be more organized than you normally would be. Um, I have been a faculty member and I have flown by the seat of my pants many times coming into a lecture and just gone off the cuff and done what I wanted to do but when you're working in this environment, you do need to be structured, you need to be organized. Tell the students ahead of time what you're going to be doing. Provide materials ahead of time so they can review it and they're not trying to look at a PowerPoint and listen to your lecture and be on their screen, et cetera. Um, have a structure, have an agenda so they know what's gonna be happening and when they can plan questions that way. They know when there's going to be a break for them to have a little less uh, engagement, et cetera. And then make sure your lighting and sound are good. Uh, students who are straining to hear you are working harder. Uh, if you're having to talk louder, it's making you more fatigued. So these are all options when you're looking at, is video your best option in this situation? You know, do you have all the things in place to make it your best option? And is it necessary? Which is something we'll talk about. Carmen. Yeah, and I just wanna add like, so this is um, just for you as you're doing this, you'll see that my, my computer, I have it on a riser. My screen is on a riser. So that when I look at my camera, I'm look my chin is straight to the floor. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes when we get on a laptop, we might be looking down like this. That's incredibly difficult for your neck and head. And uh, so you want to make sure that you're you can sit up straight and look at your camera uh, even, so that your chin's even with the floor. If you can have your feet resting on the floor, that's great too. That makes your body less have to work less, but you're actually physically exerting yourself by doing this on Zoom. So you want to make sure that, you know, you're ergonomically situated so that your body doesn't get quite as uh, tired after, you know, a couple of meetings in a row, which we all probably have had. <laughs> you, know, you have difficult schedules too. Yeah, I'm sure you feel it in your back, 
yeah. you've been sitting, you know, in a Zoom meeting for a long period of time in a chair. It's different than when you're lecturing and you're moving around and you're, you know, your body is engaged in different ways. It can definitely be really hard on your body to be sitting and in this kind of structured way. Mm -hmm. It can really hurt hurt your neck here too. <laughs> Just, <laughs> if you, you start feeling some neck pain, uh, that's probably it's because you're looking down a lot. So try to keep your chin up this way. And, and so that your spine can support you. One other small note that it, often we use two screens. We'll see, um, I have that meeting sometimes, and I'm sure you've seen that uh, when you're teaching, you might want to have two screens up, one where you can look at your PowerPoints and one where the cameras. Keep in mind how that looks to your students. If you're looking to the wrong screen the whole time and talking, it's difficult for them to feel engaged as well. I have a lot of meetings where somebody's looking at me like this. <laughs> And it, it's very, it's very strange. So just practice yeah. at a good time to record and practice and see, or have a, a colleague, you know, view it and see how it looks to them. Right. If you, uh, if you have, if you are using Zoom as your platform, you might notice that there is a personal meeting room. Uh, if you don't have that kind of option for your, um, your video conferencing, whatever you're using, you can just set up a meeting with yourself. Yep. But I would re highly recommend just doing a meeting where it's just you where it's just you, and maybe you say, if maybe, you know, recite a poem, whatever you want to do, and then go back and watch that video. And I know we look at ourselves all the time, and I get sick of it. Um, but if you look at this video and really think about, okay, what's the background look like? And is, am I speaking clearly? You might have to speak with one beat slower than you're normally used to speaking, just one little beat so that it comes through clearly. And then, um, you know, so watch that video. See if, you're, if you've got a light in front of your face, right? You don't want a light behind you because that's like taking a camera photo in the sun. You can't see yourself if the light's behind you. Yeah. Okay, so we have somebody in the chat. So let me open. I've got my screen sharing on. So. She has an elevated option on her desk so she can stand. So a standing desk, which is a great. Oh, beautiful. Ground. Um, you know, you have a place to, to you know, move around or, or, or stand up or sit down or change your position. That's a great idea, especially if you're lecturing. If you're doing any kind of a lecture, um, it kind of can mimic your podium. You know, I can't maybe have the free reign that you used to have in a classroom. But. So just using your little, you might see on the bottom of your toolbar, you'll see a little reaction emoji. So just using that reaction emoji. How many of you, when you're teaching live in class face to face, like to move all around the room, like you're everywhere. Yeah, you're like, yeah. How many of you uh, give all the dog and yeah, there you go. Who's running from end to end and up and down. Um. <laughs> yeah, so if you, um, so this, uh, I'm just using a Logitech camera that it has a wide angle, so you can see most of the room that I'm in. That's a really great camera habit. It's not expensive and you can move, like, so feel free to move around, use your things. You can also put up a whiteboard. Yeah. Need one. You can put a whiteboard behind you, like a live whiteboard, instead of using the one on Zoom, right? Um, so yeah, if you if you are comfortable, if that's how you, you feel good teaching, I would um, recommend that you consider moving around a little bit while you're teaching on Zoom or your web conferencing software. Let's say that way, because it might not be Zoom. Okay, next slide. Sorry, my computer needs its coffee. Okay, there we go. <laughs> So you want to talk about this for a minute? So as I had said, you know, being organized is really important. It's going to make it easier on you and easier on your students. So as much as possible, provide the materials ahead of time. Uh, put them in your online classroom. Say, this is the PowerPoint I'm going to go over. Or this is the article that we're going to talk about. Maybe you would have gone over it in a different way in face-to-face -face teaching, you know, but make sure they have those resources early. They can then have it, review it, and come prepared with any questions they may have. Um, definitely encourage the off-topic conversations. There is a, um, a lot of feelings of isolation, uh, I think just worldwide at this point, but in online learning and just in their lives in general, they're probably not seeing people as much as they used to. They may not be working like they used to, and now they're not taking classes as they used to. Um, so encourage them to connect peer-to-peer -peer with you, uh, have different conversations, bring up things that are going on in the world, just as you would have naturally had occurring in your traditional classroom. Students would have come in, you would have asked, hey, you know, how was the weekend? Or did you go to the game? Or, you know, what's going on on campus? I saw there was a huge parade outside. Whatever's going on, you would have a conversation. You didn't just walk in and lecture to them. You got to know them. So give them an opportunity to get to know you and each other. And then this is a big one. Be animated in those live videos. It helps so much. 
it helps if you're moving around and you'll see Carmen and I are both, we, we tend to move a lot. We tend to have a lot of animation to how we speak. That might be the online teaching we've been doing for years, but it helps to engage your audience. It's just like when you're lecturing, you know, if you're lecturing 200 students in a lecture hall, if you stood there and spoke the whole time, they're gonna not be paying attention. But if you are moving around the room, if you are doing different things and engaging them, it is going to help. Um, we also encourage being silly sometimes. Um, it can help, laughter is a good thing. And bringing that in to these live sessions will help break things up, make you more approachable, make it a more human interaction. Mm -hmm. So some ideas we have for silliness, right? Yes, yeah. um, first of all, I have had uh, faculty members have like crazy hat day. Okay, so like it's a Friday, crazy hat day, bring in a crazy hat or a scarf or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, sh should we show them the features of the virtual space? Sure. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing for just a minute. Um, this is a, so on your Zo um, Zoom app, so the can I get it? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. I can get it to the bottom of my toolbar. Sorry about that. So if you look at the bottom of your toolbar, you'll see the little camera where you would normally turn on and off your camera. There should be a carrot beside it, a little up arrow. And if you click that and choose, uh, you can choose either. Sorry. I would say choose video filter. That tends to be the most fun. So That's choose the most fun. So if you choose video filter, I can, uh, you know, give myself some sunglasses like this. Rebecca can become an alien, but you can, you know, say, oh, say it's somebody's birthday. Maybe you would like to give them a birthday hat, or, you know, maybe you want to joke about having to wear a mask these days. Mm -hmm. um, so you can do things. There are like things like crowns. So if you have somebody who was the most participatory today, maybe we have a crown. Look at Rebecca's now got on her. Regalia. It is nice. So these little um, video filters, allow you to do a little bit of fun things, maybe silly, but um, you know, for birthdays or special occasions or something where you want to acknowledge someone, you can give them a little, a little virtual background. They can do that. And one idea Carmen and I had talked about when we were talking about this, because we occasionally have pulled these into our own meetings um, where we come show up as different characters. But, uh, you know, let's say you just had a really tough test, you know, like, and it was a tough one, and you knew that it's a hard one, a midterm or a final, and you can have them, you can send out to all of your students, hey, I want you to show up with a filter that represents how you felt. So when everyone comes up then, as a class, and they're all like we are now, they're all going to have their filters on showing how they were feeling. And it's another way to just create that engagement with your students. So, and it sounds so silly, but these are, these are college students. They're silly sometimes. They do a lot of really fun things, and they tend to jump on board with things that are going to, you know, be engaging and be silly, be, you know, have them, like, compete a little maybe with their peers and what they're doing and how creative they can be. Well, look at all the fun things that are going on. See? <laughs> So um, the, yeah, there we go, Claire's got a uh, brown. Um, so is the video filter only available host? It is not, but if you don't see it, likely you have to update your Zoom app. Yeah. And the way that you do that is to open your app and you'll see your picture in the top right hand corner. Mm -hmm. You click it and then check for updates and Zoom will update. You probably don't want to do it right now because it'll probably <laughs> kick you out of this week, but um, you can update and then you get all these neat uh, things that Zoom is trying to, Zoom was not originally created to be an educational tool. Zoom was created to be uh, a business tool. And so um, they are trying to sort of, now that everybody's using them, they're trying to sort of make things uh, more secure, right? So we'll talk about that a little bit later, but also more fun. And you'll notice your reactions when you do an update, the little emoji reaction at the bottom, there are now more than there used to be. It used to just be thumbs, thumbs up. up, thumbs up, down, clap. Yeah. You know, that was it. Degrees. Yeah. And now you have, you know, like the little fireworks and now you have all kinds of things like that. So they are trying to adapt as much as possible. There you go. Nice celebration. Uh, so that's a great way to do a, an informal poll. If you just say, like I did before, how many of you like to walk around the classroom? You can just literally be like me. Um, great informal poll. Those things last five seconds and then they go away automatically. If you want a more robust question and answer session, if you look over to where the chat, it's going to be on your right. If you don't see a chat, you have to click it. 
click on the little uh, call out button at the bottom of your screen where it says chat and it will open this chat and you can see things that uh, you know go faster, go slower, yes, no, these kinds of things. Raise hand. Yeah, there you go. Exactly, Becky, you got it. Okay, so these are, there's, these are ways that you can engage students without doing a formal poll, which is an option in Zoom. But in Zoom, they do allow you to do kind of informal things like that um, to uh, quickly gauge everybody's sort of the temperature of the room, I guess. Okay, so fun stuff, fun stuff, but we have more. I'm going to share again. Yeah, we'll, we had fun coming up with the yes, we did. Fun ideas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next screen. Okay, can you be synchronous without video? Of course you can. Um, so think about if there is a time when you can be synchronous with your students, but not be projecting a video. And there are some times when you can do this. Um, for example, um, in your, uh, uh, you're using Blackboard. Blackboard has a wiki tool, mm -hmm. which is a real time, everybody edits at the same time. So they can literally be in there working and you can see them working. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, you know, oh, you know, everybody just goes off and does their own thing. You can literally see them working. You can be real time. If you prefer to use Google Docs or something like that, that's also an option. But they can be there chatting with you, engaging with the material, but just not on camera, okay? And that's another way to sort of think about it. Are they researching something really difficult and maybe they need to use library resources or, you know, something like that? Um, they can be synchronous without the video. So just think about if there's a time when that's, it may not be possible with your subject, but think through that as, a, as an option that might be helpful. Even uh, just <coughs> office hours, if you right. were able to say to, you know, students, I'm available for immediate response via email from this time to this time. Mm -hmm. Again, they don't have to hop on a phone. They don't have to hop on a video. They can send you an email and know that you're going to be responsive, but they, they can just write the email. Maybe that's how they're most comfortable and know they're going to get that feedback right away. They don't have to wait, you know, a couple hours or, you know, or, or 24 hours or whatever your rules are at the school. They'll have it right away. And you can just put it in and say, this is the time I'm able to get right back to you. Mm -hmm. And before, before I move on to this one, I almost forgot to talk about this, but I think it's so important. We, Rebecca and I were, had a really good conversation about scavenger hunts. And it's such, uh, you know, I want you to think scavenger hunt in the broadest sense possible, right? So, um, you know, I had, uh, for example, in the spring when we shifted suddenly, I was supposed to have this big research project with my students. So I invited a librarian to my online class and said, you know, like, well, what ideas do you got? <laughs> you know, like, we got to get them uh, in the library without being in the library. And he gave them a scavenger hunt, and it was an online scavenger hunt. So they had to go into the library databases and the, you know, resources and references and find X, Y, Z, right? Like, they had to do this, and it was on a Google Doc. So they put their information there. It was, you know, synchronous. Uh, and I thought it was a really great idea. And I, I was, you know, really impressed with it. So, um, but uh, Rebecca, give us some ideas that you had. We'll, we'll just phrase from here. So as, as I said, I teach at George Mason University um, and I teach uh, tourism marketing there. And when I used to teach on campus, um, to break it up when it was monotonous, sometimes I would send them on a scavenger hunt out onto campus to, um, either go find items or sometimes it was to find something and come back and pitch it to our class as a, a destination on campus. There's no reason that can't be done in an online format. And what uh, Carmen and I talked about, let's say you're teaching biology and you're learning about organisms. You could have them go and search for something that relates to the topic. If you're, you know, the and put in like the classification or, or the information on it. If you're teaching, you know, math, you could just be like, find something that's, you know, a pattern or ma mathematical or ties in in some way, even if it's not very specific to the topic, but it's more general to get them engaged. Uh, mm -hmm. Art is very easy to send them out, have them all, again, put it up as their pictures and have them share. Um, Creating ways for students to also get up and go do is going to help with engagement. And then you're still all working together at the same time, but again, not in this video format. Uh, we love the idea of a scavenger hunt, um, the emotions, sharing your emotions, having, you know, everybody say, 
you know, today we're all going to come to class wearing blue. So your whole class is in blue, you know, <laughs> or whatever your school color, you know, pick your school colors. We're all coming in or what's your favorite team, you know, come in something that's current and they're going to get excited about and want to do uh, creates other opportunities. Yeah. And I like, I like the scavenger hunt where they, you know, they can't, there are many things they can do in a scavenger hunt that they're safe, even though we're in a pandemic and maybe they don't want to go out, um, into the world, right? Um, maybe they wanna, maybe you can say, go around your block and see if there's um, a, a historical marker that you could um, now tell the class about. And they can either do it in class or maybe, you know, even people that um, have limited access to computers typically have a phone mm -hmm. or, um, you know, access to a phone. And so they can really easily upload a video that way or, you know, it, it, even an audio. Um, to pitch something to us or to argue something for us. And, um, you know, so, you know, you could say you have one hour to go do this. Um, you're going to go do this and then they come back and present it. If your class is an hour and 20 minutes or something, or, um, you know, give them an, an express amount of time to yeah. go do something and come back and present it in the class. And that's also synchronous, right? Like you don't have to you know, sit there in a chair for an hour. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can do your own and come back. Yeah. I had students pitch me something they found in their house. We were working on marketing, you know, uh, concepts. And I wanted them to do a couple things, tell me their target audience, things like that. And said, go find something. And they just found something in their house and came back where I would say, this is, this would be my target market for, you know, my toaster. And here's why. And it made it much more fun for them. I, you know, it is incredible that that happened synchronously I apologize to yeah. anyone and um, I cannot see it as host so this is part of the problem right yeah I, I actually cannot see um, anything that's happening for you um, uh, so looks like you're successful I, I turned off their camera I think or they left I don't know uh, I actually I removed them and reported them. them okay I reported them to um, the zoom people the zoom people thank you yes so I reported them that way. Um, I can't actually stop their camera, but I can actually report them to Zoom. So that is what I did. So uh, how do you do that? So if you are not seeing the participants list over on the right-hand side, um, if you look at the bottom, you see little two little uh, bodies, and that has the participants. So click on that, you'll see the participants over on the right, and then um, you can if you hover your mouse over those um, people's names, you mm -hmm. will uh, be able to report that person to Zoom, remove that person from the room, report that person to Zoom, et cetera. Um, and probably what I'm gonna do with this video before I send it to you to share with others is probably edit it so that that won't happen again. Uh, I don't want that to go further yeah. than, than this room. Man, I was so excited talking about pedagogy. That just ruined. <laughs> yeah, we are so excited talking about best practices. Unfortunately. Yes. So. Well, thanks for letting us know. Yes, thank you for for sharing. Because again, as host, you can't tell that that's happening, mm -hmm. and um, if if that is happening, you need to, which is another best. Um, yes, I will definitely. Um, another best practice is to have a person in the room who can be your uh, eyes, right? So if you, you know, it's a really great idea to designate a student to help you with the chat mm -hmm. and to help you with things like this, right? So if, uh, you know, you can do a different student every single time and just say, you're gonna be, you're gonna be my co-host now, or you're, they're not gonna be co-host, but you're gonna be my co-pilot. And mm -hmm. um, so I want you to help me manage the chat and make sure I've answered all the questions. And if, um, uh, if, you know, something like that happens, you can just, you know, send me a quick message and we'll take care of it. Okay. Yeah, it was a real example. I'm sorry that... Sorry we had a real example. We don't really need for that to happen, but it happens to the best of us. So, you know, I, I use Zoom all the time mm -hmm. and uh, happens to the best of us. So I apologize. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about how <laughs> we prevent this. Uh, like I just said, yeah. acknowledge, get someone to help you because you are sort of as the host. 
I can't see what's happening with my, when the, when I share my screen, for example, it takes up a good bit of my desktop. And so I can't even see you, all of you guys anymore. You're just little tiny boxes. And so, um, yeah. So let's talk about things that you can do. And, and one thing I just want to note is you'll notice that often they'll pick names that will get them administered to the room. So you saw it with Zoom administrator. So somebody who's letting people in through the waiting room will often allow someone in with that kind of a name, thinking that they're supposed to be there. And I will say that there were many people in that line of people. And you can just admit everyone, which is what I did. Mm -hmm. And that person slipped in. So maybe you want to be more careful than me. Yeah, or um, they, when they joined. Huh, what'd you say? I don't, I don't know when they joined. Yeah, it was a, it was a line of people. Mm. Um, so um, the question from Robin is on the co-host, does Zoom allow you to share administrator rights so your moderator could handle the administration related to hiding reporting? So if they are a co-host on the meeting, which you have to set up before the meeting, um, they can do a lot of things that the host can do. The only thing they can't do is, um, create breakout rooms, but the rest of the things they can do. So um, yes, there you go. They have the, the, the administrative rights to do that. And, and to get rid of someone, yeah. And absolutely. to get rid of someone and boot them right out. And report, I would say like, not only just yeah. remove them, report them. Oh, always right. report them, yeah. Yes, um, so that, that, that Zoom understands what's happening and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, we didn't even talk about breakout rooms and that is, um, that is a feature on Zoom that is, is a little, a, a little um, rocky. So, um, and it's just available in Zoom. And so we won't talk about that, but if you are interested in using breakout rooms, please email us and we will um, work with you on breakout rooms if that's something that you wanna do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you use Apple's sidecar to hook up an iPad, you can see the participants on the iPad while you're hosting. Yes, if you have, what amounts to two screens. You can see your participants on one and um, your sh screen sharing on the other. Um, but still, I don't know if you guys could see what I could see, but um, what I saw from my perspective of that particular bombing was I saw all of you exactly like normal. It was your video face and my, and my screen share. So I wouldn't have known that anything was wrong. So I appreciate your telling me. Is that what, what, tell me what your experience was. I mean, don't tell me what you saw, but tell me what your experience was in terms of, was your video gone? Was my video gone? No, it's just their video camera, Carmen, just like, like this would be. So they weren't centralized. It was just, it depends on, we were all on our widescreen with the, mul we were on our oh. break screen. Okay. Okay. So it's hard yeah. when there's larger groups because you can't see below the fold always. Okay you know, of your, of your, there can be two pages, two pages, four pages. So that's why it's helpful. Um, and we set up, you set up meetings where you have wait rooms, you have, you know, passwords and all the things, but um, unfortunately people who want to try to get through. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, again, apologies. And I will edit that video before we share it with anyone at all. Okay. So let's talk about this Zoom bombing that we just experienced. So these are things that people have tried to implement. As you know, as soon as someone makes an update and implements a change, people who want to do this figure out how to get around it. Yeah. And so aside from what we just did right now, which was someone alerting the host mm -hmm. and co-host, something's wrong. We report the person that removes them from the room. It blocks them from ever trying to get back in here. Um, you can use a passcode, which is very helpful because that means the only people that can click on that link and enter the room have a passcode. Um, that is only helpful, right, if you make a new meeting every time, right? If you have, if you set up a class time that's recurring and it has the same passcode for every meeting. It's not secure. Right, it's not as secure. So, you know, I know that's easier, right? Um, so you might do something like either make a meeting for every new week or say like every two weeks, I'm starting a new meeting. So that you don't have to do it as many times, but just note that if you have a passcode or some kind of restriction and it 
happens every single week for the entire semester, so 15 weeks, right? Mm -hmm. That code can get out pr pretty easily, right? That's a pretty easy and, and there are programs that can figure out the passcodes. And right. The secure as they keep trying to make it, there's also ways around it, unfortunately. Yeah, so, and the other thing is, um, you might consider sometimes using your personal meeting room. So that's a feature of Zoom. And it allows you, it's a very easy way to just start a meeting. You don't have to schedule anything and, and you just give it to your students and you say, these are my office hours here, come on over and get to my personal meeting room. That is super easy and it makes life so much easier sometimes. But the problem with the personal meeting room is that your personal meeting room ID is just like your cell phone number. It doesn't change ever. Not this semester, not next semester, not a year from now. And so if you tend to give that out for your office hours, depending on how many students you have per semester, that's how many people have that link. And so like, I, I know it's easy to do that. And I know it like a lot of times it's just like, oh yeah, here's my personal meeting room, jump in. Um, it's, it's not as secure as making a meeting and having you know, your office hours affiliated with a meeting, right, mm -hmm. that, that Zoom has generated. So, you know, I just want to point that out that I can see how that could be potentially insecure. So um, I don't make you afraid to use it, but like. Well, I, or just use it judiciously. Yeah. You know? you know, to say, if somebody has to ask, ask you a quick question, you can just be like, here's a link. You don't even have to say, this is my personal meeting room. You can say, here's a link, right? Mm -hmm. And just, they jump in, you have the meeting, everything's great. Yeah. Um, just publishing it on your LMS and having a hundred students a semester have it, you know, that is a potential security risk. So you just want to be aware of that. And you run the risk if you're having a meeting with a student one-on-one -on -one that's about a private issue, somebody coming in and getting access to their personal information. So, so there is the passcode. There's the waiting room, which you all came in and that person slipped in because there was a, a line of people and I just admitted all of them. So you want to make sure that you're not, um, you admit everybody one at a time. Now, if you have a class of 118 people, the waiting room can become annoying. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, it, it, but it does allow you to see that there's a name, that there's, you know, who, who is that name? Are they on my roster, etc. And that's a good use of a, if you have a student that's willing to help with that or a couple who could help, they can do attendance that way as well. You could say, hey, here's a list just check it off and admit them as they come in. Um, it's tedious, but you know, maybe you have students who need some, a couple bonus points that week, or you can create a way that it's, it's a helpful tool. Mm -hmm. um, I, I always say long ago, I used to have to wheel in the projector and I had a button pusher each week, whoever was hitting the button when it was time to change the slides because the projector was in a lecture hall. And that button pusher got two points and that was it. <laughs> but they signed up to be the button pusher. <laughs> so they would get their two points. And maybe having a, an attendance checker, you know, or, or a waiting room attendant. Yes. And I think, I mean, I think that's a great, you know, you want to kind of engage your students in the responsibility of the community of the class. Mm -hmm. And that's a great way to do it. Yeah, we all fought to be line leader in elementary school. <laughs> you know, they might want to be the attendance. They want to be the, the, the waiting room. room attendant yeah. and how and the other thing is make sure your students use their names mm -hmm. real names first name last name preferably you know so that when they're coming in you know who it is you can quickly identify if someone is not who they should you know who should be there so you might see the last um the last couple of bullets don't necessarily have to do with security but they have to do with something else that's happening now that is a fairly recent development that I wanted to point out to you, and that's called, uh, there are some bots in the uh, video area that will attend class for your students and log off when class is over. And so it appears that they have been attending your class for the entire time. And that um, software is called Bueller, so I don't know if you've ever seen Ferris Bueller or not, <laughs> but that is what it's about. Um, and so one of the things, I put a, some references to help you with Bueller, um, but they can, even, they can even have a camera on. Okay, so I don't, I don't want you to think like, oh, I'm going to have them turn on the cameras and that's all. Mm -hmm. So someone can film themselves on a camera 
and, and that will just run in a loop yeah. and it will make you look feel like they're there in the class. Um, even if you go into breakout rooms or something like that, the bot will go into the breakout room as the student and come back out. So ways that you can do, you know, combat that sort of thing, which is a little bit different than security, but still I think um, touches on, you know, things that we fear in the video sphere is um, having impromptu polls, so something like cahoots or quizzes or throwing something a little bit different, like we talked about, the scavenger hunt or the, you know, impromptu conversations before class or after class, those kinds of things. Yeah, color code cards for answers, something. Yeah. yeah, alert them that, yes, we know what we're gonna do during class, but that doesn't mean that you just get to have a bunch attend for you, right? Um, that you have to contribute, like you will be expected to contribute during the time that we are in class. So I am I saw a blink for a chat, Rebecca, what is that? Yeah, uh, Katie said it seems like a lot of work to avoid work. I always think that when those kinds of things come about is that the person who created that probably attended all their classes <laughs> to learn how to create the bot. So the student doesn't, other students don't need to attend class. <laughs> so maybe it's their way of getting ahead, you know, if nobody else attends. I, I feel the same way. Like if you put as much time in this class, you would be a straight A student. Like what? <laughs> but um, that is. That's true. It's a lot like, of work. And avoid it. Unfortunately, that they they do that. Uh, I, I, I'm not really Number sure. Number fifty-six of life. Uh, people spend more energy avoiding work than energy. <laughs> and I think as, as uh, professors, you've all learned that <laughs> very clearly. That is the truth. They will find all the ways to avoid doing the work. Yes, yes, it's it's a little crazy, but okay. So those are just things that I, I wanted to to touch on. And so here we go. I put all the references here. So if you have not read any Flower Darby, um, Flower Darby was, was always kind of doing this work on online engagement and how to, you know, like transition from face to face to online. She's always been doing that work. So this year, of course, her work just it kind of exploded. Um, and so you can find her on the Chronicle um, website. You can find her in a number of places, but I um, link directly to her. It's called Small Teaching Online, which means uh, I have to pivot to this whole online environment that I'm not used to, and I'm used to teaching in another way. And so she talks to you about taking small baby steps. So if you've ever seen What About Bob? Um, so baby steps to, to getting this uh, to be something that's rich and meaningful. I also uh, put the um, citation for the Zoom fatigue definition, description, uh, ways to counteract it. And then you'll see Dustin Baki does a high, epic higher ed, and he is the one that talks about how to beat Bueller and ghosting during your online class sessions. So there's a video and he walks you through different uh, ways to engage students and different tools that you might use. And he does have some free resources for available for download on his site. So, um, I mean, I don't mean to do like a big ad for him in particular, there are probably lots of people, but I just know that he has a specific one about Bueller if you're concerned about that in your class. Um, so I want to make sure that we allow um, everybody the opportunity to ask any questions that they want to ask or... Or what's working or what have you found yeah. helpful to you or maybe that'll help share with everyone else. This is what happens in your classes, isn't it? When you ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> we were not specific enough about our question, right? What is working for you to help you? What has helped you prevent Zoom fatigue or... Right. Are you struggling with Zoom fatigue? I've got a I've got a question first. I mean, is there any has there any research been done that you've uncovered that would speak to the the additional stress and fatigue suffered by the Zoom presenter as opposed to the Zoom participants? I, I think. Well, I think that. Um, okay, before I is Angela somebody we all know. Before I enter, let her in the waiting room. Is Angela someone we know? We're not adding anybody in unless we know. I'm not her. adding anybody to this room until I know who they are. Does anybody know an Angela? There's no last name. I don't know who it is. No. Let's see if I can view this person. Yes. Okay. She knows her. Okay. Um, 
I don't think there's necessarily a distinction that I've seen specific articles that just distinguish between the two. I just think there's a, a lot of information that kind of puts the two together. There is fatigue on both ends. Um, obviously, as the presenter, there is definite fatigue. There's the lead up to the, the presentation that maybe requires more uh, engagement for, as us as presenters than we would if we walked into a, you know, a presentation that was more off the cuff. Um, and then there's all that being on, you know, you have to be on, you have to be looking at your participant list and making sure you have to be checking the waiting room, you have to be engaging, you know, the participants with you. And then for the students, there's also that level of fatigue. We talked about having to pay attention. Active listening is required in, in any kind of online in environment. They can't sit there and just kind of, you know, doodle and, and still hear like they used to maybe in class. Um, there's a lot of things going on. And then there's also all the additional distractions of their environment um, that were removed when they were put in the classroom. So I think they're slightly different fatigues, but they're both levels of fatigue. Right. Harmon? And I think, yeah, like especially, I'm just thinking about this article here. It, it's about being not able to engage synchronously. Like there's, there's almost synchrony, but not quite. And then also not being able to see everybody's body. Like I cannot pick up on all your nonverbal cues, which I normally can do very quickly and, and you assimilate all of that information really quickly. I can't do that on Zoom. And if you think about um, this, this picture of all of us in a gallery, if you walked into this room, room if you walked into this room, you wouldn't know who the presenters are, right? Um, you, you can't tell, like the, it's, it, everything gets shifted to this two dimensional sort of area. And you don't have like in a classroom, there's a clear distinction. The person teaching is at the front, right? Like there's the, and they're standing up, right? Like that's a clear distinction. So because I think the research focuses on sort of body and brain, that maybe there's not a distinction between those two, but I would argue that just like today, <laughs> I'm doing to inner people in the waiting room and we've got a chat and now someone's um, Zoom bombing and now I'm trying to do a PowerPoint. Like, yeah, there's a lot of things happening. And I would argue that there is a little bit more stress for the presenter than, than there is for uh, someone who's, who's watching. Right? And, it's just, and it's just a slightly different kind of fatigue, but there, there's definitely fatigue on both ends. Um, let's see, we had a couple just quick comments. I'm missing the nonverbal is draining. I would agree, I'm incredibly uh, a nonverbal cue reader. And so for me, it's very strange sometimes to be in this environment and not be able to see it. Mm -hmm. uh, are there background colors or fonts that are known to reduce eye fatigue? So the, the, the colors that tend, and you can probably Google a color wheel and see this, but the colors that do really well are either dark on light, absolutely distinct, in case you have someone with a color uh, difference, you know, in, in the way they see uh, colors. Yeah. Um, and also every screen is a little bit different or really light on dark. Yeah, really light. So, uh, so you see here, I have white on this dark blue. Uh, most things are black text on white. So that actually helps me read. And also if you can use a sans serif font, um, yeah. that is very helpful. And, you know, just make your fonts really large. Um, all the things that, you know, you might suspect, you know, get the little curly cues off. Don't put up uh, so many photos and clip arts that we, you know, lose our mind. The animation shouldn't be spinny, you know, that kind of thing. Um, there is also PowerPoint, PowerPoint rules, very similar to when you create a PowerPoint. You don't want too much on the page. You want it to be really clearly defined. No crazy fonts, not a lot of imagery, no transitions that are, you know, <laughs> the windows and explosions and things. And yeah, don't, don't. Please don't, don't do that to your students. <laughs> Um, and I might also recommend if you want to Google dyslexie, D-Y-S-L-E-X-I-E. It is a font that is free. And what it does is you, you'll see, if you look at my slide right now, English letters are built upon one or two or three shapes. There's a line, there's a curly, there's a round thing, you know, th there are very few shapes. Um, and dyslexia slightly alters each shape so that each letter is very distinct. So there might be just a little flat piece inside of the D that makes it look like a D. And there may be this one, this little edge over here of the G is flat. And so it's very subtle, it, but when you put it up on something like a PowerPoint, dyslexia can help 
um, help people particularly to have problems mixing up letters, which is really easy to do in English because they all look similar. Um, this dyslexia font can help a little bit. So I just want to put a plug in for that. Mm -hmm. Now I know we are running out of time. Um, so let me put up my last slide, which is our email again, because I want to make sure that you know that you can contact us and we will work with you uh, one individually. One. Yep, one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. So Christina or anyone else, do you want to say something as we close down our Sure. Well, thank you guys. And we have a couple more minutes. I'm, I just want to um, sort of pause and see if there's any other if there are any other questions. Uh, I thought a couple people opened their mic before the last question. So is there anyone else that had a comment or a question? Can we help you? How, we, how, we see, how, we, how do you edit a Zoom video? <laughs> Good question. So the, the recording is stored in the, in the background of video, uh, of Zoom, sorry, in the background of Zoom. And you can download that as an MP4, which is a video file. Um, and it just has a, you go to your video and it just has a download button and you just download it and you can edit it in, in the video software that you're comfortable with. And there are hundreds of them. Um, I'll just take it down here and down, uh, edit it right on my computer with the software that I'm used to. But typically computers all come with their own video editing software, or you can use uh, Panopto or uh, Kaltura, or whichever your institution is using. Mm -hmm. And you can literally just snip out the piece, the offending piece, Yeah. get it out of there, and then uh, save it as an MP4 and upload it wherever you need it. Mm -hmm. It's pretty fun. Yeah, so if you have someone... Oh, I'm sorry, Bob? Can you use Bob. iMovie to do that? You can use iMovie, absolutely. Okay, good, great, thanks. Bob, Bob also know that um, our media services and our Blackboard team can use Camtasia to edit things for you. So you can just send us the, doc you, if you send us a link from um, the video saved in OneDrive, we can um, edit it for you and get it back to you and actually upload it to your class if that's what you prefer. Oh, that's, oh, that's wonderful. Hey, yes, thank you. That's an excellent service. Yeah. And, yeah. It can, and it could just be something simple, you know, that hopefully not nearly as offensive, but somebody says something you don't like, or, you know, there's just noise and you need to remove it. You can go ahead and clean that up before you, you share it with your students, which right. is a really nice thing to do. Someone's dog has a moment where they <laughs> lose it. And, uh, you know, you just want to snip that out. You can do that very, very Crying easy. children. <laughs> we, I did have, I, taught in an all women's institution when we uh, went home for the spring. And, um, you know, in this time still, women are primarily expected to take care of small children. And so I had three students that were taking care of four or more children under the age of two um, because their families were like, we have to work. You've got to take care of all these kids. So um, if there's no childcare, you have to take care of these kids. So it is, uh, children are in the house and whether that's their personal children or they're responsible for their children or they have family members in the house because there's a hurricane and they had to come back or, you know, whatever, uh, you know, this household can have a lot of noise that you didn't think. It's almost always dogs, I feel like. <laughs> the, only, the only time I've wanted to edit something was when I forgot to turn off record and then a student lingered and had a conversation about me that was something personal about, you know, being a research assistant. Or something, and I, because I, I want to always turn off record right. when I'm staying after class to talk to students. That's yeah. a brilliant example. Yes, perfect example. Yeah, could I just add uh, one thing um, to reinforce what uh, Christina mentioned at the beginning, um, just in case people aren't that familiar with iDesign, that if you have any questions, instructional design related questions, you can reach out using that email address. There's other contact information you can get from the FCTL website about how to, how to reach out and connect with an instructional designer. But they'll respond to you uh, in, in fairly short order within an hour or so, is my understanding. And, um, and they're willing to work one-on-one. -on -one. They can establish a Zoom meeting. They can look at your computer and see what's going on, that kind of thing. So. Um, there are, we have a lot of capacity right now, and it's 
underutilized. So I uh, really encourage anybody that has any questions about uh, instructional design to please reach out to iDesign and, um, and get your questions answered. Thanks, Kevin. Great. And thanks, everyone, for uh, your time today, making the time to join us. And uh, thank you to iDesign, Carmen, and Rebecca uh, for putting these materials together today and sharing some of their expertise. We appreciate your time. Well, our pleasure. Thank you for having us, and thanks for sharing uh, this time, because I know it's busy. It's time yeah. Thanks, thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah, Bye. Take care. There's an iPhone, so I didn't know if that person was a person. I think you can send them. <laughs>